isn't a smiling Irishman, and I didn't drive months mad. Thanks for the gag, Rochester. <laughs> The makers of Blue Bonnet Margarine and Tender Leaf Tea present the Fred Allen Show with Fred's guest Leo DeRocha, Portland Hopper, Minerva Pius as Mrs. Nussbaum, the Tender Leaf Workshop players, the DeMarco Sisters, and Al Goodman and his orchestra. And in case you're doing your Christmas shopping early, my name is Kenny Delmar. <laughs> Last Tuesday, ladies and gentlemen, an Army Air Force crew completed a record-breaking non-stop flight from Guam to Washington, D.C. in a B-29. Tonight, we bring you a man who will never again be 29, oh. and here he is, <laughs> Fred Allen. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And Kenny, I had the misfortune to overhear that uh, joke there. A man who will never again be 29. You are sharp tonight, Kenny. Oh, thank you, Fred. You are as sharp as either end of a butterball on a warm day. <laughs> but I read about that flight from Guam to Washington. Those AAF boys broke the non-stop, non-fueling record. Yeah, well, who held the old record? The old record was held by Superman, Kenny. Superman? Yes, when Superman flew, he was handicapped by adverse weather conditions. He got caught in a storm, as I remember, over Alaska. Ice formed on the hem of his cape. Headwinds ripped off his jersey. His credentials were blown away. Well, uh, if, if Superman, if he landed without that big letter on the front of his jersey, how did people know who he was? Well, Superman is a contortionist, Kenny. He made a mess of himself. <laughs> For holding that Mr. record. Mr. Allen! Well, Portland, just in time. They tell me, did you uh, did you enjoy your Thanksgiving dinner? And no turkey jokes, please. I heard so many turkey jokes this past week, feathers started growing out of my radio. It's molting around the antenna. Well, <laughs> Mom and I went to a hotel Thanksgiving. Oh, for your dinner? Yes. The chief cooked a wonderful meal. The chief? You mean the chef, don't you? The cook at the hotel is an Indian. Oh, the Algonquin. I oh, I think about it. Say, you and uh, your mother must be stepping out. Oh, Mama has to. She's in the social swim. Really? If your mother is in the social swim, she's going down for the third time. <laughs> your mother thinks society is something they have for the prevention of cruelty to animals. Mama's... Uh, Audubons. They have a society for the cruelty to Audubons, too. Mom is going to the opera tomorrow night. Oh, really? The riffraff are getting in this season? <laughs> That's right. The Met is opening this week. All the big opera stars will be back here in town. Lawrence Melchior, Lily Pons, Singing Sam, Andy Russell. <laughs> and, uh, is your mother going formal? Is she wearing her mink knickers? <laughs> Mom is wearing her new backless evening gown. Oh, backless? Uh-huh. She wants to show off her new tattoo. Ta tattoo? On Mama's back, it says, Buy Victory Bond. Oh, boy. Some slogan. Oh, it works out swell. Well, how do you mean? Between her shoulder blades, Mama has a little mole. And? In the word victory, yeah. the mole dots the eye. The mole and the mole. <laughs> in the mole knowing that much about grammar. Well, with your mother, <laughs> if it ever gets low someday, it'll be a, a comma. But with your, mother's, uh, with your mother's shoulder blades, the whole thing must be in parenthesis. And speaking of... <laughs> and speaking of parenthesis, your mother is a parent, and this is a good time to start for Alan's Alley. What is your question for tonight? Well, Portland, this week, this past week, President Truman recommended a five-point national health program to provide uh, free medical care for the nation's sick. And so our question tonight is, what is your reaction to the pre president's health plan? Shall we go? As one glutton said to the other glutton, let's cram. <laughs> Here we are, regardless of the traffic. Here we are back in Allen's Alley, Portland. I'll see if Senator Claghorn is in. Somebody, I say, somebody now. <laughs> Claghorn's the name. Senator Claghorn, that is. I know you. I'm name. from Dixie. Now, look. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, that is. I only ate the part of the turkey that's facing south. 
out. <laughs> Senator, I know you're from the South. Yeah, no man living can make me wear a union suit. <laughs> Don't What's start. on your mind, son? Speak up. Well, if you give me half... This a... is America, son. you got free speech. I'm trying to exercise... Well, go ahead and talk, son. <laughs> Don't wait to be prodded. Prodded, that is. Look, and I know what... I know what prodded is. <laughs> now, just inhale for a second there, Senator, and answer this question. How does Washington feel about the president's health program? We had... Now, listen to this, son. <laughs> We had, I don't want to waste any more here, we had a big, a, a big debate in Congress. Somebody was running down Senator Hill. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, running I... down Hill, that's a joke, son. I know it's a joke. Yeah, when I... you hear something funny, laugh, son. Well, I... And I know it, I wasted another one on you. But... Now, admit it, son, you ain't much of a whip. Look, Senator... What do you think will happen if the government provides money for our medical care? Things will, I say, things will, will boom, son. Well, how do you mean things will boom, Senator? If people can get paid for being sick, they'll all lay down. I see. With 130 million Americans flat on their backs. Yes. Things will be looking up. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you. Remember Stonewall Jackson. I'll keep him in. <laughs> well, that takes care. <laughs> I like to stake Stonewall apart and throw a rock at a time at the senator. Well, now let's see what's on Titus Moody's mind tonight. Howdy, Bob. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Moody, uh, uh, frankly, you look a little tousled tonight. I just got up. You were in bed all day. No, I fell down. I just got up. So tell me, Mr. Moody, what do you think of the president's new health program? I could have used it 40 years ago. Oh, you mean as a baby you were sickly? Yeah, doctor said I was anemic. Oh, you had no blood? If a mosquito lit on me, he was wasting his time. <laughs> Gosh. If I cut my finger... The cut wouldn't bleed? Just hiss a little and pucker. <laughs> well, how did the... How did the... How did they cure you? Every day the doctor gave me a shot in the arm. And all these shots? When I was five years old, I was all shot to health. <laughs> Good. And you, uh, you haven't seen a doctor since? You know the old saying, bub, a duck a day. Oh, no, no. You mean an apple a day keeps the doctor away. I eat a duck a day. A duck? My doctor's a quack. So long, bub. Well, Mr. Moody looks as though he's been eating decoys. Well, let's try this, uh, let's try this next house. No. Oh, Mrs. Nussbaum. You were expecting maybe Catherine Schlepburn. Now, <laughs> uh, tell me, uh, Mrs. Nussbaum, are you happy about the president's plan for free medical care? Coming up this so close that I'm having a secret. Oh, a secret, huh? Uh, another atom bomb? Another nerve bomb. <laughs> You mean... Uh... All that teensy, wincy garments I am crotcheting. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're crotcheting the garments. <laughs> and little bootsies I'm oh, buying. Oh, little bootsies. Dieties I'm oh. cutting. Lullabies I'm lining. Rock <laughs> Now, look, just, uh, uh, just let me interrupt your, your hit parade for a second there. <laughs> Is your husband, Pierre, making plans, too? Then the spark is flying in for a landing. Yes? Pierre is standing by to shout, Roger! Roger. <laughs> well, you have no doctor's bills to pay. This is giving Pierre an idea to naming the baby. Oh, you're naming the baby in honor of the president's plan? The government is paying. Yeah? Pierre is calling the baby Shingle. Shingle? Why? 
This one is on the house. Oh. <laughs> That brings us to the last shack in Allen's Alley. Let's see what a knock here will do. Hello, Mr. Allen. Why, it's the five DeMarco sisters. What are you kids doing here in McGee and McGee's house? We're rehearsing our song in the middle of May. May, that is. <laughs> well, let's see. <laughs> Claghorn's children, huh? Well, let's see uh, how the middle of May sounds now at the end of November. All right. <laughs> and the DeMarcos. And that brings us to Kenny, who has his topic well in hand. Kenny? One topic that never loses its fascination is good food and how to enjoy it. Remember the letters F-N-E for flavor, nutrition, economy. Blue Bonnet Margarine gives all three. Flavor, nutrition, economy. Yes, it pays to get Blue Bonnet Margarine. For Blue Bonnet gives you not just one, not just two, but three important things. First of all, flavor. Delicious flavor. Fresh, delicate, country sweet. Flavor that makes folks smack their lips and say, I couldn't ask for a finer table spread. And remember, you get nutrition in Blue Bonnet. Proved nutrition. Every fresh, sweet pound is rich in food energy, rich in vitamin A. And it's economy to use Blue Bonnet. It saves you real money. Costs so little, you can spread it on twice as thick. Delicious Blue Bonnet margarine is a product of the makers of Fleischmann's yeast. The reputation of this fine old firm stands back of every pound. Get Blue Bonnet at your grocer's tomorrow. The wonderful new margin that gives you flavor, nutrition, economy. All three. Al Goodman and his synopsis symphonist have tried to play No Can Do. And it came out No Can Do as well. Yes, uh, Portland, you wanted something? I brought you an aspirin. You look all in. Oh, I am partly in. It's that Christmas shopping. Have you finished yours? Yes, I bought my relatives a case of blue bonnet margarine. One case of margarine for 20 relatives? They can spread it among them. It's spread, you know. <laughs> Did you buy anything for me, I hope? Well, that's what started all my trouble, Portland. I went into Tiffany's. You know, it's always so quiet at Tiffany's. The atmosphere is so refined. Well, I was standing at the lavalier counter browsing. Six Pinkerton men were holding my arm. <laughs> At the next counter, suddenly I heard an argument. The salesman was saying... I'm sorry, sir. I can't take... Listen, you meathead. If you lay a hand on me... I'll pull your nose down your face so fast you'll think it's a zipper. Leo. Leo DeRocha. Leo, what's, uh, what's the trouble? I came in here to buy some cufflinks. And I refused to take his money. No good. You're nuts. I've been spending this money for the last two months. Look at these bills, Fred. Leo, this is Japanese occupation money. I know. I'm loaded with it. I'm yen happy. (laughs) 
Say, that's right. I read that you and Danny Kay spent two months entertaining our boys in Japan. How was your trip? Wonderful, Fred. We flew over 32,000 miles to Manila, Guam, Kwajalein, Okinawa, Yokohama, Tokyo, and Korea. Say, did you see that city where the first atomic bomb was dropped? Yes, Fred. We flew over Hiroshima for about half an hour. It was a shambles, huh? A shambles? It looked like Ebbets Field after a doubleheader with the Giants. <laughs> Well, what about that city where the second bomb landed, Nagasaki? Well, you know that old song, back in Nagasaki, where the fellows chew tobacco? You mean in Nagasaki? They haven't even got a cuspidor left. <laughs> Danny, did you see General MacArthur over there? Yes, Danny and I saw General MacArthur in Tokyo. What did the general say? Well, he just said hello and went back to adding up his points. <laughs> Did you, uh, did you meet any of your Dodger players on the trip? Yes, I did. I saw Kirby Higby, one of my pitchers in Manila, uh -huh. and Reuben Melton hitchhiked 150 miles to visit me in Tokyo. No kidding. I guess you ran into a lot of Dodger fans with the G.I.s, too. You'll find Dodger fans all over the world, Fred. I met them everywhere. They're great guys. Well, now that you're back, Leo, I suppose you're going to take it easy. No, Fred. I'm going to start worrying about the team for next season. Leo, every season you worry, worry, worry. For what? Why don't you give up baseball? Give up baseball? What will I do? I'm too old for radar. Why? <laughs> Why, you've just finished entertaining hundreds of thousands of G.I.s. You can go into the theater. Who wants to be a stagehand? What? <laughs> What stagehand? You can be a star. Why, I'll put you in my show. Your show? Leo, I have written a new opera. It's based on Pinafore. I've seen a lot of Pinafores on Broadway. The Hot Pinafore, Hollywood Pinafore, Memphis Bound was Pinafore. I know, Leo, but my show is different. What is it called? The Brooklyn Pinafore. <laughs> and you will be the star, Leo. But Fred... Look, the Brooklyn Pinafore starring Leo DeRocher. The first scene in my opera is the bleachers at Ebbets Field. It's the big game between the Giants and the Dodgers. Brooklyn rooters are sitting around in their underwear. <laughs> Ushers are running up and down the aisles with rocks looking for Giant fans. <laughs> Peddlers are going through the stand selling raw meat sandwiches for the kiddies. And as the curtain rises, we have the opening chorus. The bleachers sing... <laughs> Dodger team runs out on the field. The stands break into a cheer. Flatbush, Greenford, Thorough Hall. Who's the team with something on the ball? Dodgers! Dodgers! D-O-J-E-R-S! Dodgers! And then, Leo, you run out of the dugout. I come on? Yes, Leo. You stand right near home plate. The rest of the team kneels around you in a semicircle. <laughs> The infielders have lavender bats. <laughs> the outfielders have mandolins with mother-of-pearl picks. The crowd quiets down as you step up to the microphone and sing. I am the captain of the Dodger team And a right good captain to be I am quiet and subdued And they say a little crude but I frighten rather easily. He is quiet and subdued, and they say a little truth, but he frightens rather easily. Bad language and abuse, I never, never use. No one do I intentionally hurt. Though heavens I may occasionally say, I never call an umpire jerk. <laughs> but never, no, never. What never? Well, hardly ever. He never called an umpire jerk. So give a cheer and give a shout for the Dodger captain with a big loud mouth. 
Great, Leo. If Rudy Valley is listening in, he'll never know another good night of sleep. <laughs> what happens next, Fred? Well, now, Leo, comes your big love scene. The game starts, and as you're standing in front of the dugout, something hits you on the ear. A pop bottle? No, Leo. It's a rose. Someone, someone has thrown a rose. At Ebbets Field? <laughs> Well, this is a fantasy, Leo. You look up and there she stands, the beautiful mystery girl. She speaks. It was me that turned the rose, Leo. <laughs> mystery girl, you're back. Yeah, I come to wish you luck against the giants, Leo. You bring a message, fair one? Yeah, Leo. Go out and light at them, slob. <laughs> Mystery girl, I cannot conceal my love for you any longer. Please, Leo. You don't love me? Love you, Lippy. I'm carrying a torch for you that could light up two night games. <laughs> then why won't you marry me? You gotta get me your man's okay, and that's gonna be tough. Well, who is your father? Mystery girl, who are you? You wanna know who I am? Okay, I'll tell you. I'm called Little Bobby Son, sweet Little Bobby Son. My heart for you would be good, boy. Before you make me your mate, let's get this one fact straight. Frankie Sinatra comes boy. I'm sweet little Bobby Socks, dear little Bobby Socks, but I'm not getting younger, you see. Too long I have tarried, but since Frankie's married, it's left me the road just for me. That love scene will make people forget Mr. Anthony and Cleopatra. <laughs> Wallace, <laughs> Wallace, Beery, and Marjorie Maine couldn't have done it any better. Well, what's the next scene, Fred? Now it's the big climax, Leo. Get this picture. It's the last half of the ninth inning. Two men out. The crowd is going crazy. You step up to the plate. I'm the umpire behind the plate. We hear Red Barber over the loudspeaker saying... What a game, folks. Leo DeRose is at bat. Leo is at his only hope. One run can tie the game. The crowd is tense. Cockeye Allen, the umpire, yells. Play ball! There's the pitch. DeRose swings. Yeah! It looks like a home run, ladies and gentlemen. Leo is rounding first base. He's around second, around third. He's heading for home. The ball is coming in. Leo's going to slide. Yo! Why, you lardhead, I was safe a mile. Quiet, you. I'll knock you flatter than your singing voice. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, I'll slap your head up into a point, and then I'll round it off. <laughs> Says who? Says me. I'll pull that big tongue of yours out so far you'll think you're wearing a red muffler. <laughs> yeah, you fat as mustache. Ah, you... <laughs> Your sister's died, but... Ah, your grandmother's so silly. Ah, your aunt Van Dyke. <laughs> I said you're out. The game is over. The Dodgers lose. Oh, yeah? I'll beat your brains out. Give me that bat. Oh, thief. Little Bobby Sox. <laughs> you. Put down the bat, Lippy. But it's only Cockeye Allen, the umpire. He is also your future father-in-law. <laughs> Mystery girl, you mean that... Cockeye Allen's my old man. What's the meaning of this, Bobby Sox? Leo wants to marry me, Cockeye, don't you, Leo? Me marry an umpire's daughter? They'll throw me out of who's who. <laughs> You'll forgive Cockeye, won't you, Lippy? Well, if you say so, Bobby Sox. Shake hands, Cockeye. At last, an umpire hears a kind word in Brooklyn. I may be an umpire, Leo, 
But I ain't really a bad guy. I know, cockeye. But with those thick glasses, how did you ever become an umpire? I'll tell you the whole sad story, Leo. <laughs> When I was a lad, I could not see a hand held up in front of me. In spite of how I squint and peer, I couldn't tell my father from my mother, dear. My eyes were oh so very, very weak, but now I am an umpire in the National League. His eyes were oh so very, very weak, but now he is an umpire in the National League. As the years went by, I grew up a schnook. My eyes were so bad I couldn't read a book. The army took me, but they sent me back. I tried to kiss the general because I thought he was a whack. I'm still half blind with no physique. That's why I'm an umpire in the National League. He's still half blind with no physique. That's why he is an umpire in the National League. As an umpire, I gained great fame. I called a player out who wasn't in the game. Another decision which you may have heard. I'm the guy who made Greenberg stay on third. My life is a failure. I'm up the creek. That's why I'm an umpire in the National League. His life is a failure. He's up the creek. That's why he is an umpire in the National League. And then... Then there's a happy ending, Leo. I give you permission to marry my daughter, Bobby Sox, and the entire ensemble joins in the big finale. All of Brooklyn feeling blue, cause the roach is getting wet. To an umpire daughter who, he needs like a hole in the head. With me as with his wife for the rest of our lives. We can fill and cool. But before you take her hand, you must first understand, I'll get no more lip from you. Swear never, no never, what never, well hardly ever. <laughs> My lip I will button up when you say batter up, even though games you will rob. I'll be ever discreet, so tender, so sweet, and soon I'll be out of a job. So give three cheers and one cheer more for the Dodger captain who will talk no more. So give three cheers and one cheer more for his conclusive broken head. Attention, please, while Kenny tells us about a lady we all know well. She is famous everywhere for her beauty, her good taste, her dress, and her home. That's the American woman. She is graceful, witty, wise, and above all, practical. That's the real reason that Mrs. America prefers tenderleaf tea balls over all other kinds because they are so practical. The advantages of tenderleaf tea balls make them first choice of the nation. They're better in every way. Made with famous for flavor tenderleaf brand tea assures you cup quality, delicious flavor. And put up in those individual packets makes it easier, more convenient, more gracious to serve. It adds to your enjoyment of finer tea. The packets are tasteless filter paper, a modern improvement. Your tea is filtered, clear as it's being made. And each tender leaf ball means a world of quick comfort when you need it most. Just drop one in a cup, add boiling water, and your tea is made. So for every good reason, ask your grocer for tender leaf brand tea ball. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you, Leo DeRosha, for joining us tonight. Next week, our guest will be Wallace Berry. Good night, and thank you very much. This is the National Broadcasting Company.